The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of any major corporation whatsoever. And we're back with more of the Popon film. Well, my darling bunny cakes, this week on the big show, we are going all the way back to the year 1974. Yes. Ah, I remember the year 1974. I was negative three years old then. Yeah. And I had a nice, cozy one-bedroom apartment in my dad's nuts. It was a fixer-upper, to be honest. It was a (laughs) fixer-upper. It was a bit cramped in my dad's nutsack. Yeah. A lot of things happened in 1974. 1974 was a big year. Big year! Mm -hmm. In 1974, Richard Nixon resigned from the presidency following the dreaded Waterworld scandal. Yes. People still remember his historic speech. I am not a crook. Dry land is not a myth. I have seen it. (laughs) But two million dollars, man. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty incredible. You got to love any movie that starts with the hero of the film drinking his own pee. Yeah, drinking his own pee. Way to not skimp on the opening, guys. Drinking his own pee on Waterworld. Yeah. It's Waterworld. Yeah. I mean, I would think, first off, polar ice caps melt. The oceans are a lot less salty. A lot less salty. Yeah. Yes. And from there, I would think it's easier to get the salt out of the ocean water then the salt and everything else out of your pee yeah yeah one of these days we got to do that movie yeah in 1974 a nationwide 55 mile an hour speed limit was enforced with the purpose of pissing off the white man Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and it worked too. In 1974, Whitey B. Trippin. Yes. There is, well, the, that is that is what led to the rise of CB radios. A, exactly. a fad that nobody really looks back fondly on. Except C.W. McCall. Well, that was at that same time. Yeah. 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 But that's it. 19- truckers, truckers started getting. CB radios because of the 55 mile an hour speed limit so that they could help each other watch out for cops. I said a pig pen this here's rubber duck. Mm-hmm. We ain't going to pay no toll. <laughs> Maxwell, what's your CB Maxwell, what's your CB radio name going to be? Mine's going to be Papa Bear. Need, needs to be smaller. Needs to be shorter. CB radio names are short. And no, actually, mine's going to be uh, fragrant. Uh, mine's going to be Salty Nuts. That's going <laughs> to be my CB radio name. Salty Nuts. What's your CB radio name going to be, Maxwell? Uh, fart. fart Duty. That's a good That's a good fart CB radio duty. name. I'm going to give Bella her own CB radio name. Her name is going to be... Uh, Fancy nose. <laughs> I I am I am going with Captain Symbolic. Captain Symbolic. Uh-huh. Uh Fancy Nose. This here is uh Salty Nuts. Uh I got I got twelve bears up my ass coming down the turnpike. What's your copy? Can I get some help? What's your twenty? When you want to be a trucker, the first thing they ask you is, can you make the noise? (laughs) That's the first thing they ask you. And you go, yeah, I can make that noise. And then they say, oh, yeah, well, let me hear it. And you go, oh, man, I can't do it. They're like, yeah, it's difficult to be a trucker. Get out of here. (laughs) And that's basically the entire test. It's the Mm -hmm. same thing with police. Yes. My name is Salty Nuts. That's my trucker name. Except, your, except your police. Your trucker name is Fancy Nose. And I'm Salty Nuts. Police, 
because it's a dangerous job, they also have to be able to go, woo, 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 yeah. woo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's another fact about uh, various uh, people. Every fire station has one sensitive guy. Yes. And and they have a sensitive guy so that he can make the siren noise. Uh huh. So they so when they're whenever there's a fire, they all pile into the truck and they put the the crying guy on top of the truck, and then they say something that hurts his feelings. And they're like, "Hey, sensitive guy, your shoes are stupid." And the guy goes, "But my mom gave me these shoes." <laughs> <laughs> and that's how they get the that's how they get the fire truck noise. Uh-huh. You just get them to cry until finally they we're at the fire. We were just kidding. Your shoes are good. Woo! Thank you. I really like these shoes. It's science, damn it. Yeah, it's science. Yes, Maxwell? Okay, now you're talking crazy, Maxwell. Now you're just talking crazy. 1974 was the year that Stephen King released his debut novel, Carrie, which was followed soon afterwards by the follow-ups, Samantha, Charlotte, Miranda, and Mr. Big. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I just made a Sex in the City joke. (laughs) That right there is an historic moment. Yes, it is. It's going to be some other historic moments on the show. You people better recognize. Yeah. At first, I said, you know what? For the opening of the movie, I'm going to maybe make one 1974 joke, maybe two. Anyway, uh, we're not even a third of the way done. I've got (laughs) so much more. So much more. In 1974, the... One of the hottest selling toys was the Telly Savalas Jack in the Box. Yes. You would... You would turn the crank and boo, baby. That's how it would work. And that joke marks two straight weeks of Telly Savalas references in the Pope on Phil. Yes. There's another yes. historic moment right there. Telly Savalas. That's weird. Did you know, Bonnie, that I actually had a band in 1972? Yeah. I did not. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely true. It was a Carpenters cover band. We called ourselves the Plumbers. Yes. You know Karen Carpenter, how she had an eating disorder? Mm-hmm. Well, ours did too. Uh, our Karen Carpenter, six hundred and seventy-two pounds. She was a hefty woman. Yes, she was a hefty woman. This is this was the typical evening that a typical person would would have in nineteen seventy-four. A typical evening would be, you know, just putting on your bell bottoms, mm-hmm. having a little bit of CB radio time, and then just listening to Kung Fu fighting while masturbating to the latest episode of Mod. Yes. That was a typical relaxing evening in 1974. Well, if it was a good one with a lot of Adrian Barbeau, that, that oh, was, yeah. there, there's a case to be made, is all I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. In 1974, a young George Lucas was busy going from movie studio to movie studio saying, I have an idea to pitch you. It's 1974, and I have an idea for a nine-movie sci-fi series. Yup, I have nine movies in mind. (laughs) Nine whole movies. Want to make it clear that I, in 1974, have nine movies in mind. I certainly Mm -hmm. don't just have one movie idea, and that if it gets popular, I'll suddenly say nine. No siree, I've got nine movies in mind. Mm -hmm. Just one. Nine movies. In 1974, the top, number one, top-selling toy was the Magic 8-Ball. And the worst-selling toy, the Magic Abe Vigoda's Balls. Yeah. Those were not that good. 
Here are the most popular baby names. Because in every t- wait, wait a second. Every time, see, see, every time you made a wish and shook Abe Vigoda's balls, it just kept saying, "Don't stop." Don't stop, you schmuck. <laughs> so here, ask are again. The, Please yeah. ask again. Yeah. So here are the top baby names, the most popular baby names in 1974. Uh, number one, Cooter. That was number one. Okay. N- number two, Billy Bob. Yeah. That was the number two most popular baby name in 1974. Number three, Tammy Joe. Tammy Joe. Number four, Kojak. Figures. And number five, uh, Richard Nixon. So those were the top five most popular baby names in 1974. Yeah. Some of the more popular TV shows included the Sonny and Cher Comedy Hour, mm-hmm. the Watership Down Musical Cavalcade of Laughs. Yes. And of course, the Texas Chainsaw Variety Hour. Yes. That yes, one. that was good. That was good. That one was fun for the whole family. It, it was so much better than the Star Wars holiday special. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. That was fun for the whole family. That was chopped up uh, in, in every episode. Yes. The Steve Miller Band had a hit with their song "The Joker," which means that 1974 was a big year for people who actually used the word "pompatus." Pompatus. Yes. Yeah. Because you know that in, like, 1973, there was one guy that was like, well, I think that it's important when talking about this to talk about the pompatus. God damn it, Gary. Stop using the word pompatus. No <laughs> one uses that word. Mm-hmm. Well, you guys just shut up. One day, that word will be a real super popular and on everybody's lips. That day will never come, Gary. It's 1973. Yeah. It's, it's not. So you gotta happen. know that, that guy. Was, you gotta know that guy, that guy was pretty excited when the song "The Joker" came out. <laughs> like, yes! And you have you have never heard that word again. Yep, that not word before. only exists never. in that song. Yeah, yeah. In 1974, Eric Clapton was given the electric chair for shooting a sheriff and allegedly threatening a deputy. Yes. It was all very, over very the sad. newspapers. Yeah. He was he was very talented. In fact, Eric Clapton's son wrote a song about it called uh Tears in Heaven. Which yes, is he did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In nineteen seventy four, the IRA started terrorizing London with car bombs and Molotov cocktails, and to this day. It is unclear as to why the ignorant Russian Albino Federation started bombing England. <laughs> but if I were an albino, I'd probably be mad as hell and not going to take it anymore, too. Mm-hmm. And also, in 1974, the director Mel Brooks released a small, quiet, low-key Western film that very few people bothered to see. And that is this week's movie, the sad, tear-jerking Western drama known as Blazing Saddles. Yes. Now, now, 1974, with everything else that you described, Mm -hmm. 1974 should have also been the year that uh, Ron DeFeo had killed his parents and uh, siblings. I forget what kind of siblings he had. And claimed that the devil made him do it. And that those That's... were the first murders in the Amityville house. Yes, yes. Those I, were yes, the I read actual that murders. Yeah. I read that somewhere. I also read somewhere, I, I, I forgot the woman's name, but apparently in 1974, some newscaster killed herself live on the air shooting herself in the head live on TV. And it's really? interesting because she had she wrote a script where she was talking about the news and she scripted in her own suicide. <laughs> nice. And not only that, but in the script that she had in her hand, 
she also scripted people finding the body and what they should say when they find the body. <laughs> now that's good. Culture in 1974. Let me see if I can find if I can find her name because I because I I looked her up and was reading all about it and I was I was quite impressed with the story because I had never heard the story before. I had never heard the name before. Christine Chubbuck, a newscaster, committed suicide during a live broadcast. Her la- her last words were in keeping with Channel 40's policy of bringing you the latest in blood and guts. And in living color, you are going to see another first attempted suicide. Then she put a gun to her head and killed herself. <laughs> nice. I've never heard of her before, but... I, I had never heard of her before either. I, I just looked up pop culture in uh, 1974, and every website had like most of the same things, but a few different. And yeah, she has, her, she has a very big uh, uh, Wikipedia page. And she, while yes. while you were looking that up, Ron DeFeo, that was 1974. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, uh, Christine Chubbuck, she killed herself in a live broadcast in Florida. Can we get that footage? Is it out there somewhere? Um, y- There is uh, a really bad, grainy, difficult-to-see version of it that is on uh youtube it, it it's difficult to see i wonder if that's where they got the ending for the howling i don't know yes after ron, ron the DeFeo sh- killed his father mother two brothers and two sisters yeah um here you go. Here's here's what I was talking about. After the shooting, news director Mike Simmons found the papers from which Chubbuck had been reading her newscast, which it, it contained a complete script of her program, including not only the shooting, but also a third-person account to be read by whichever staff member took over the broadcast after the incident. She had written uh, for, her con- for her condition to be listed as critical. <laughs> Yeah, I find that mm-hmm. absolutely fascinating. That that's that's talented writing. Yeah, yeah, and confident. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But now, what if her brain splattered on the paper? Yeah, she should have had a backup, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles. Hysterical God, movie. What? God, what a horrible fucking movie. I hate this movie to death. I absolutely hate it. It is horrible, and uh, it's stupid, and it's not funny. (laughs) And I don't like it, and nobody should like it. It's a stupid fucking movie. I don't in any way believe that statement. I am just pretty sure that I have once again made history as the first ever podcaster to say that about Blazing Saddles. Yes, I would bet you are. historic. I would bet you are. Yeah. Of course I love this film. Everybody loves this film. In fact, I'm pretty sure that hating this movie is against the law. Like, yeah. for real. Like, nobody is allowed to hate Blazing Saddles. And and Mel Brooks made a lot of movies, and Mel Brooks was always funny. He was always a funny guy, even if he did Get Smart or anything else. Uh, but, Dracula Dead and loving it, I fucking hate to yeah, death with a but, passion. Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein, and yeah, maybe not Young Frankenstein, but definitely Blazing Saddles. That's his masterpiece. Blazing Sa- uh, uh Young Frankenstein is a great fucking movie, especially if you've seen every single solitary Frankenstein movie. Yeah. Like when I was little, I had seen Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, and so I watched Young Frankenstein and I thought it was funny, but then. Eventually, when I got older, I watched Son of Frankenstein and mm-hmm. Ghost of Frankenstein and shit like that. And that's when I realized, like, holy shit, he's not making fun of just one Frankenstein movie. He's making fun of every fucking Frankenstein movie. Yes. Like, especially when you get to, like, uh, Son of Frankenstein. And I'm like, oh, my God, there's the Burger Master with the wooden hand. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. oh, my God, that's perfect. 
And there's so much that I never got. Like I, it wasn't until I was like 30 year, years old that I realized that Bruja is German for glue. Yes. And that's why horses are I, freaking out. I never knew that. The, yeah, I, I was trying to, because it, it, it had just recently come up on Netflix, so I, I just recently watched it. And I was trying to tell Jeannie that, but I couldn't fucking remember what it actually meant. Yeah. Yeah. There's always little things like that. Like today, I had to, uh, God damn it, what's his name? I had to Kill Google him. Randolph Scott. I had to Google oh. Randolph Scott today. Yeah. I was like, okay, th there's got to be something here. Who the fuck is Randolph Scott? And so I Googled him, and I'm like, okay, all right, that makes sense. Cowboy, uh, he might have also have been in silent movies. Uh, was, I know he got he really in, popular as doing cowboy movies as some of the first movies. talkies. What? He was in silent movies, and he was in uh, talkies and spy movies and dramas and a few like sci-fi and, and uh, horror movies. But out of all the movies he did, like, 60% of them were westerns and he was just his face was just a western face. Yeah. When you think of uh, when you think of westerns apparently you thought of Randolph Scott. In fact, before they redid the Oakland Raiders logo, the F Oakland Raiders logo face was based on Randolph Scott. Really? Yeah. Yeah, according to Wikipedia. Yeah, wow. Randolph Scott was the face of the Oakland Raiders until they redid the logo to make it look more generic. <laughs> yeah, Randolph Scott. Bella and I have been saying that all day. You do it for Randolph Scott. Yeah, we've been saying that all day. <laughs> Bella only watched about 30% of the movie because she had a hard time with the N-word. And I, I don't know. I, you know, we could probably do the breakdown that you usually do. I don't think we really need to discuss the plot of Blazing Saddles. If you haven't I've seen Blazing Saddles, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. But I've, I've got a bit. It's it's not the longest, but I've got like a very basic breakdown of the plot. Okay. Go for it. Oh no, we haven't gotten there yet. There's still oh. more to talk about. Oh. We're still talking about how no one is allowed to hate Blazing Saddles. Yes. No yes. one can hate this movie. Everybody likes it. And really, we should use this film to bridge the divide in America. <laughs> now, first off, I fucking hate that phrase, bridge the divide, because that phrase is almost always used by a white Christian Republican. And mm -hmm. what they really mean is... Give up. We need to bridge the divide between we Republicans who are right and all of those pesky, violent, crazy liberals and blacks and gays who are all wrong. That is what people say when they say things like the division in America and all those sorts of things. And it's crazy because the people who say that bullshit are the same people who threw an eight year long crybaby shit fit about our black liberal president. Mm hmm. So the same people who said that Obama was a terrorist sympathizer and a secret gay and a Muslim and the Antichrist and that he was going to kill all the old people and round up all the Christians. These people who were angrily, violently resisting all eight years of Obama's presidency and called him the worst, most racist names. Those people are now saying, well, why aren't those liberals embracing Trump? Why can't they be <laughs> nice to him like we were with Obama? So basically, yeah. fuck those people. Mm -hmm. Fuck the divide in America. Trump lost the popular vote. He is a dumb fucking idiot and a con man and a racist and an asshat, and I fucking hate him. But to slowly but surely get back on topic here, if you really want to bridge the divide in this nation, what you need to do is focus on things that we can all agree with. Yes. For example, Ryan Seacrest looks like he sheds his skin every month. Yes. That is something we can all agree on. That is well, that it's it's not just a look; that's an actual fact. Yeah. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, Christian, Muslim, I think we can all agree that Ryan Seacrest uh, burrows underground and sheds his skin one time a month. Mm -hmm. For example, I think we can all agree that that a 
Adele's music is fucking amazing. Uh huh. And B, if you really think about it, Adele is just a BBW JK Rowling. <laughs> that is something we can all agree on. Yes. And that Blazing Saddles is a great fucking movie. Boom, we're back on topic. This is a movie that everyone can agree with. And I am certain that if I am suddenly surrounded by a gang of angry, drunken rednecks, and I live in Oklahoma, so that's almost always a possibility, the surefire way for me to get out of having my ass beaten is just to say, yo, where the white women at? <laughs> Day brightener. I am suddenly not going to get lynched. But I am hearing more and more from these motherfuckers fucking millennials about how racist Blazing Saddles yep. is. Have have you heard that? Oh, yeah, there's, yeah, there's no way this movie could exist now. And that is... Because I, I, people are too sensitive. I find that so funny because this movie at the time was groundbreaking in how how much fun it was actually making of racism. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, and I could see people's point if they, if they don't see the movie in context, you know, and that context is gone. Yeah. But this was a groundbreaking movie. And I find it so funny that people consider it racist now. It's like you, you're, it you're not getting I, the movie, you know, just like, and it reminds I found me it of interesting because I, hmm? no, go ahead. Okay. It reminds, it, rem, it reminds me of Dario Argento. Okay. Because J- Dario oh, Argento so. in a lot of his movies would have a, quasi swishy homosexual character and that homosexual yes. character would generally be uh, he would not be the top guy in the movie but he would be maybe like the second you know so a, a very important character to the movie and you can look at that now and be like oh well look at the stereotypical swishy homosexual guy well this is homophobic no it's not homophobic because gay people were not in movies yeah at all you know and if they if they were they were flaming you know like like the marty character from barney miller you know his characters were on the swishy side, but they were not flaming. You know, so so in the same way as Blazing Saddles, this at the time was breakthrough. Yeah. That can now be looked at as like homophobic I, and Blazing Saddles can be looked at as racist. Yeah, I was I in that same sense I wonder if uh I I've wondered recently if nowadays you could make uh Robin Williams the bird cage. Yeah, Robin Williams the bird cage shouldn't have been made then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But people still love that freaking movie. It, it's it's the problem I have with the movie is is that I am old enough to have remembered La Caja Full being a being a massive hit. You know, a, a, a yeah. French movie. You know, so when when I found it in my video store, yeah. I rented that shit and I watched the original La Caja Full in French, and that was an awesome movie. So to to they so to see, couple, they? Uh, they made at least two. I had seen both yeah. of them. The second one really sucked, from what I recall. But then the Robin Williams one, mm. it, it it was so yeah. fagged up, you know. Yeah, yeah. 
like okay we can't we can't do this movie about two homosexual men and here's the issue and blah 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 it you know we can't just do that no this has to be this this has to be over the top gay stereotypically gay yeah but I'm not sure if I would have felt that way had I not seen the first movie. True. So, um, it, the interesting thing for me was that I watched this a lot when I was a kid, but but uh, because I grew up with cable, but I'm pretty sure that like 75% of the time that I watched it, I was watching a clean version. Yeah on like TBS or something like that, the USA network. So it was interesting to me. And, and also m- young me focused on the ending because the ending is fucking beautiful and revolutionary and, and odd and bizarre. Yeah. And I don't, I, I did not remember the beginning to this film at all. So it was shocking to me to watch the film and suddenly be seeing these black guys singing Frank Sinatra. I'm like, Ooh! I do not remember this. I remember everything else in this film, but they're singing Frank Sinatra. That's so freaking awesome. <laughs> you know? That was that was a, that was a pleasant that was a pleasant surprise for me. So yes. let's do this. Stats. 1974 comedy by Mel Brooks, who is basically the Roger Corman of shtick. Yes. Um really love the producers, the original producers, mm-hmm. uh, not with zero Mostel. Yes. I'm still weirded out by the fact that we can now have movies based on the play, based on the movie. That's that still that's weirds so, me. Out. It's wrong. <clears throat> yeah, like like they just did Hairspray, the live TV musical based on Hairspray, the movie based on Hairspray the musical based on Hairspray, the movie. Mm -hmm. Bizarre to me. That is absolutely bizarre. Yeah. So I really like the original producers and I like Blazing Saddles and I like, um, but the thing about the the, the, the Hairspray, the Hairspray remake, the, the last Hairspray remake, I I was really happy that they got a, they got an actual woman to play John Tavolta. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it interesting, interesting. Uh, uh, they uh, they the, Bella was watching. She no, her school went to go see like a special musical version for kids of Hairspray. Oh, okay. She, she came home and she asked me, Dad, how come? And then later after that, they did the Hairspray live thing, and Bella said, Dad. How come every time they do Hairspray, this woman character is played by a man? And I'm like, oh, shit. How do I explain Divine (laughs) to an 11-year-old? This will take a portion of my cunning. No, all of my cunning. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, so uh, the maker of the original film did a film where people are eating shit. Okay, maybe I'll go a different route. (laughs) Okay, so trans. Okay, let me go a different route. (laughs) So that was fun. Yeah. The film was written by Mel Brooks and a whole room of other dudes and freaking Richard Pryor. And I'm pretty sure we're talking about pre light himself on fire, Richard Pryor. I no, I oh. heard. Well, it, yes, he it was pre light himself on fire, Richard Pryor. But, but not from what I heard, Richard Pryor. yeah, it was fucked up, Richard Pryor. Yeah, but not uh, light himself on fire, Richard Pryor. That's like '81, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right around like Sunset there. Strip, Richard Pryor, yeah. So, and I'm happy that Richard Pryor is in this movie, that Richard Pryor helped write this movie, 
Because every time I watch Blazing Saddles, there's a part of me that's like, this is a bit uncomfortable and this feels racist. Oh, wait, a black person wrote it. It's fine. Like, I often wonder, like, if a black person didn't help write this film, would this film be seen in a different way? Like, if a name like Richard Pryor wasn't attached to this film, would this film be as beloved as it is? And I don't think it would be. But the idea that, like, Richard Pryor helped write this kind of makes you go, okay, I feel a bit better about laughing about all of this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the the cast of this film is absolutely amazing and full of some absolutely legendary actors. Like, let's not forget Burton Gilliam, who played Lyle. Wow. <laughs> yes. That was mm-hmm. a wow. Like, I remember first seeing this movie, going, "Man, that guy who played Lyle, that's amazing." Mm-hmm. And Ralph Manza, who could forget his career-defining turn as man in commissary dressed as Hitler? Uh-huh. And wow, well, that, Robert that... Wrigley as Boris Langman? Wow, Robert mm-hmm. Wrigley got his start here. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. The film also stars a bunch of un- features a bunch of unknown actors and bit players that no one remembers, like Gene Wilder, Harvey Corman, Madeline Kahn, Dom DeLuise bunch of nobodies yes we were watching uh madeline khan do her uh, uh musical number and i'm like hey 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 bella that's uh that woman's you won't recognize her but that woman there singing she's from clue mm-hmm. and she's like who oh really which one was she and then because in uh blazing saddles she's all like busty and sexy mm-hmm. and stuff she asked me was she was she the the maid in Clue? And I said, no, Madeline Cobb played the woman that hated her. That hated her so much. It, it, it flames. Flames! <laughs> on the side of my face. <laughs> Breathing, breathless, Fire. heaving breaths. Heaving. Bella, you have the video paused. Um... There was a line in Blazing Saddles that you said, oh, my God, this is where Mommy gets it from. She says this all the time. What line was that? that? I'm trying to figure it out. But there was a line in this, and you're like, and Bella said, that's where Mommy got it from. She's always saying this. So what are the famous lines in in Blazing Saddles? Uh, Where are the white women at? Is that it? No. No? Excuse me while I whip this out. Oh, no, no, that's right. No, we were listening to... It wasn't Blazing Saddles. We were listening to Helter Skelter. Okay. What's the title say? I've got blisters on my fingers! Apparently is the thing uh, you say all the time. Actually, I don't think I've ever said that You say life. that all the time, according to Bella. You say that all the time. Constantly. You said that all the time. What? Oh, no, no. When you have blisters. I was working. Yeah. But I would come home all the time with... With cuts, with cuts yeah. So you would say and burns, all kinds of fucking burns. Yeah. This, yeah. There's nothing in this. What do you want this for? There are two bit uh, actors, character actors in this movie, and I'm so happy to see them in Blazing Saddles. And I guess I didn't realize it up until now. Like older me realizes this, and not like me before. But number one. Higgins from Magnum P.I. is in this movie. Oh, yes. And I love that. I love freaking Higgins from Magnum P.I. <laughs> and I was like, is that Higgins? That's not Higgins. I'm pretty sure that's Higgins. I'm going to IMDb this shit. Holy shit, that's Higgins. Mm-hmm. And number two, I didn't realize that the Big Lebowski is in this. He is. Yeah, no, the the other Jeffrey Lebowski, the millionaire. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I'm like, holy shit, that's the Big Lebowski. I'm so happy that the Big Lebowski is in this film. <clears throat> the film was originally going to star Richard Pryor and John Wayne, but John Wayne's like, I can't be in this film. Then Gig Young 
was going to be in this film, but he fainted on set because he was a fucking drunk. In fact, Mel Brooks said that he learned the hard way that if you're going to cast someone as a drunk, don't hire an actual drunk. <laughs> so he had already done uh, the producers with Gene Wilder, and uh, Mel Brooks still, though, wasn't sure wasn't sure that uh, he should have Gene Wilder in the film, and then eventually he, when Gig Young fainted on set, like his first day on set, Mel Brooks was like, oh, crap, I literally got no one to star in this film. Ah, oh, shit, I guess I gotta call fucking uh, the guy who I didn't want to be in the film to be in the film now. Yay! And, and, well, so he got he got lucky because Gene Wilder was perfect in that role. Like, he's absolutely spot perfect. On perfect. Yeah. But the star of the film, the star of the film is it was a relatively unknown Shakespearean trained actor, Cleavon Little, whom I actually remember as the guy as the gay guy in the closet in an episode of the NBC show Dear John. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He, 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 yeah. He won an he won an Emmy for it. Like best best uh, actor, best guest actor on a sitcom. No, I was a big fan wasn't of NBC that, sitcoms growing up. Wasn't wasn't that the Judd Hirsch show? Yes, the Judd Hirsch show. Like what he did after Taxi. Yes. Yeah. He's Cleavon he's like Little was still alive movie. then. Yeah. He was also in the Christmas, the special Christmas episode of Alf. He was in a bunch of stuff. He went, Oh, he, he was, was in, uh, Cleavon Little was always in a bunch of stuff. Yeah. I mean, Cleavon he, Little. He was in once bit. Yeah. I, I mean, Cleavon Little was around before Blazing Saddles. And he was around after Blazing Saddles, but in like really small things that no one remembers. Yeah. He was in Once Bitten for Christ with, with uh, Jim Carrey. I mean, I knew he had died, yeah, I but I, I thought he had died with like uh, within like five years of Blazing Saddles. Apparently not. Oh no, um, um, no, he he actually had a career. He just wasn't that successful afterwards. Yeah. So he did it in 1975. Dude, he died in 1992. Oh, you're kidding! Wow. Yeah. Yeah. He was in uh, The Love Boat, The Rockford Files, Police Story, MacGyver, Alf, Once Bitten. Uh, he won an Emmy for Dear John. He was in, a, he was in Fletch Lives. <laughs> and uh, he had uh, uh, his last appearance was as a guest role in an episode of Tales from the Crypt. Really? Yeah. So no, he lasted for a while. He just he was a success, but he was not successful. Apparently, Cleavon Little was from Chickasha, Oklahoma, or apparently, uh, Chickasha, Chickasha, Oklahoma. I've heard it pronounced. I've heard it pronounced like three different ways. Anyway, he's a local boy. Apparently, Chickasha, Oklahoma, is where the really cool drive-in is with the with the 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 putt putt course in front of the theater i yeah. really like it but it, there are tolls there are freaking tolls in oklahoma like all over the place and in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. like you're driving in the middle of nowhere and suddenly there's like a toll road freaking ridiculous so there's a really nice drive-in theater that's open uh 24 open all year and it's fucking wonderful but it's like three and a half hours to get there so if you're seeing a double feature you're not getting home until like five o'clock in in the morning mm -hmm. and i physically am incapable of doing that nowadays <laughs> so the film came out in the summer of 1974 warner brothers hated the film and fought mel brooks every step of the way but because the producers was such a hit they gave um mel brooks like full creative control and final cut and yada 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 so they were able 
So he was able to release the film he wanted to release. It cost only $2.6 million to make, and it made a little under $120 million. This was a huge-ass hit. Yeah. In fact, it was only the 10th film to ever pass $100 million. Really? That is fucking fascinating to me. It's sad that nowadays that could be a huge failure. Like, oh my god, Transformers 9 only made $400 million. Wah! Mm -hmm. Like, it's amazing to see how far we've come. What was the budget on it again? $2.6 million is how much it cost to make Blazing Saddles, and it made... Oh, that that, that went up a lot of noses. What? Yeah. It made $119 million. Yeah, but but no. two point whatever million at, at that time for something like Blazing Saddles. I mean, you have no no real stars, so nobody's dropping a big paycheck for the actor. You know? Yeah. Um, you're filming it on the prairie... You got a few horses. Um, the buildings, the buildings were probably already just the fronts, like it was in the end of the movie. Those were probably just yeah. the same damn things. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I figured. So that sounds like an awful lot of money to me. What? Oh, they're for Eleanor? Okay. I, I took Maxwell's water bottle away from him, from her, because she just keeps spilling water all over the floor, and it's ridiculous. She has her own water bottle. Um. Oh, eating peanut butter and jelly while podcasting is a bad choice. <laughs> this, I, sh- I really should have thought this through. Um. <laughs> I learned a lot of things about this movie that I didn't know. Like, number one, the 10th film to ever pass $100 million in the box office. That's amazing. Number two, apparently this film is the first ever on-screen fart. <laughs> I would not like, be literally, surprised. This, this, no, they, literally. Yeah. This film is considered the first film to feature... Uh, Audible on-screen flatulence is what it's officially called. But this is the first cinematic fart. The film was nominated for three Oscars, Best Supporting Actor, Best Song, and Best Use of the N-Word. Yes. So, yeah, back back in the day, you know, the, the Oscars were kind of cooler. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've got a plot breakdown. It's kind of basic, but... Um, in the plot breakdown, I al- I also describe how difficult it is to give a plot breakdown to the film, so it's very no, meta. No, no. Um, perfect Western credits open on the building of a railroad, and right from the opening uh, crooning of a Frank Sinatra song, it's clear that this isn't a normal Wild West film. Right. That's one of the great things that I like about, about it, is that it's kind of meta, and it's breaking the fourth wall, and the hero, Cleavon Little oftentimes talks directly to the to you to the audience mm-hmm. and it despite the fact that this is the wild west he's talking exactly like someone would in the 1970s and i really love that sort of thing so it, it great great freaking movie mm-hmm. anyway also the whole wild world a uh, wide world of sports reference in the beginning so <laughs> yeah. this this is a, a, a different film so basically, the bad guys want to build a railroad through the town of Rocky Ridge. Harump, 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 harump. harump. <coughs> I didn't Harvey get a Corman harump out of that guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Harvey Corman wants the townspeople to flee, so he hires a black guy to be the town sheriff. Also, I'm doing a yada, a lot of yada, 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 because it's a madcap comedy, and that just doesn't translate well to trying to break down the plot. I've been seeing a lot of breakdown, a lot of blazing saddles on my uh, social media feed lately, because a lot of people have been posting the scene of Mel Brooks as 
uh -huh. um, yeah. governor and saying um, Mel Brooks predicting Trump 60 years ago or something like that. Uh -huh. 40 years ago? Uh, Mel I'd say Brooks about 40 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Work, 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 work. Hello, boys. <laughs> yeah. Also, I've been trying to figure out there's some song that I had on my phone, and I don't remember what song it was. All I know is that it sampled the school mom saying, you are the leading asshole in the state. And everyone cheers. And I've been trying to figure out what the hell song that was that sampled that, but, but to no avail. Um... So I love the scene where the sheriff kidnaps himself at gunpoint to get out of an angry mob. That was the first time yes. that I got uh, Bella to care about the film because she hadn't she hadn't been watching it. And I'm like, but look at this. Every day they, they've got him at gunpoint. And so he puts himself at gunpoint. And I'm, she's like, OK, now that's kind of. So the townspeople are upset with the new black sheriff. Meanwhile, the sheriff meets Gene Wilder, whom I love in this film. And this is why. He seems to not want to be in the fucking movie whatsoever. <laughs> it's a different fucking film when Gene Wilder's around. It's like a madcap, madcap comedic romp, nonstop uh -huh. jokes and bits and pratfalls and laughs. And then suddenly here's depressing ass Gene Wilder who does not want to be here. And he's airlifted randomly in the film. And one of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. <laughs> he's just a completely different person with a different energy and a different like he's just this serious guy in this madcap comedic romp and it's really weird yeah yeah but also uh, with that also with that bit of gene wilder vulnerability yeah which really helps sell yes he is a fucked up alcoholic yeah yeah so Gene Wilder plays the Waco kid, the fastest hands in the world. Seriously, you're like screaming right into the microphone, Eleanor. I moved over here to try and get away from your angry screams. What is it that you want? Hmm? Is that what you wanted? You wanted the Incredible Hulk? Okay. Bill Bixby's going to be very happy with you. <laughs> well, he was the fastest hands in the world, but now he's just trying to drink himself to death. Anyway, they become BFFs, and the bad guys send Big Bad Mongo to get him. Mongo. And, and I'm watching it, and at this point in time, Bella and Maxwell are watching it. Maxwell watched it on and off. Um, it, he, he didn't care too much, but oh my god. We all broke up when Mongo punches the horse out. Like, I knew it was coming. <laughs> I knew it was coming. But, oh, my God, he punches the horse out. And I turned to the kids. And I'm like, did you guys see that? And, and they're like, see what? And I'm like, okay, we need to go back. So I go back. And I show it again. And they're like, what did he do? And I'm like, he just punched out this horse. Let's go back again. And I swear to God, we watched it like 20 times. It was just so <laughs> fucking funny. Just seeing just this big ass guy punch out a horse. And I was like, oh my God, I could watch this again and again. And they're like, yeah, dad, let's watch it again. And I'm like, okay, let's watch it again. <laughs> and just watching Mongo punch out a horse is just fucking great. <laughs> anyway, the sheriff bugs bunnies in complete with the Looney Tunes music. And that's wonderful. And even before they played the Looney Tunes music, Bella's like, mm -hmm. So basically, he's Bugs Bunnying him, and I'm like, "Yeah, hey, he's Bugs Bunnying him." Uh, uh, well, well, but he's also he he just is Bugs Bunny. This is yeah, very much Bugs Bunny type humor. I mean, even even with him kidnapping himself, that's a very Bugs Bunny thing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so. The sheriff defeats Mongo, and uh, Harvey Carmen's upset, so they get Madeline Kahn to seduce the sheriff, but then the seducer becomes the seducee, or something like that. You get the drift. Yes. So, 
because apparently, it's, because it's two, it's two. Yeah. Oh, and I love the fact that they spell all of that out the way that you would expect it to be spelled out in the closed captioning. Yeah, yeah, I really liked that. I, was, I, I was did not watch the closed captioning. Yeah, I should. No, that I, sounds I, funny. I, yeah, I always have the closed captioning on, so that's really great. I was reading as many articles as I could about Blazing Saddles this week, and one of them said that Mel Brooks is, was really upset because he kept in everything he wanted to keep in. The studio wanted to cut out the farting. The studio wanted to cut out the N-word. The studio wanted to cut out this and that. And there's one thing that he cut out that he's that he's always been upset about that he didn't get to keep in. Yeah. And it's Madeline Kahn, and it's Cleavon Little, and they're in her uh, dressing room, whatever. And the lights are off, and she says, hey, let me see if th what they say about you people is true. And she unzips his fly, and she goes, oh, it's twoo, it's twoo, it's twoo. And the line that Mel Brooks cut out is there's a silence, and Cleavon Little basically says, I'd hate to break it to you, but... You're sucking on my arm. <laughs> so I really love, I love that fucking line. It's still a great scene ev even without that, but yeah, I fucking love this movie. Um, so you're not getting Maxwell's water bottle. You just water everywhere, Eleanor. I'm sorry, tough love. You're not getting the water bottle. No, you're not getting the water bottle. Don't talk back to me. I will put your ass in a bear trap. <laughs> I will put you in a bear trap. Yeah, you better be apologizing. Here. Why don't you take this and then go polish something of mine. <laughs> there you go. So, yada, 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 Har Harvey Corman uh, goes nuts and he recruits an army of criminals that include, that includes, but is not limited to, rustlers, cutthroats, bounty hunters, pugs, con men, clansmen, Nazis, shit kickers, Methodists, and Mexicans that don't need no stinking budgets. Mm -hmm. So, the townspeople leave the sheriff. The sheriff says, give me 24 hours. And I had to Google Randolph Scott. So they invade the bad guy's camp. Where the white women at? If I ever get uh, mobbed. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, I just... And so the sheriff gets all the blacks and Asians to help the town of Rocky Ridge build an exact replica of the town of Rocky Ridge. And in exchange, the townspeople will give them all land to homestead. And this leads to just a wacky awesome ass ending um it's such a great ending the fight is so big between the townspeople and the bad guys that it spills into the rest of the studio of the yes. warner brothers studio making the film and they fight in a into a musical filled with a bunch of gay people you'll be surprised you're doing the french mistake and even into the commissary and now i i always forget to look Okay, at the end credits. But damn, doesn't that look like James Caan in the swimming pool? Possibly. Possibly. I know that, um, uh, what's, his, what's her name? She, she, she did all those movies with um, Elvis. What's her name? Clam bake. Gonna have a clam mm. bake. What's her name? I, I'm, she I'm wanting to say Anne Margaret. But, uh, yes, there you go. Okay. She's apparently in the film. She she is uh like dressed in a nun garb, like in the commissary somewhere. Oh, okay. She's hidden in the film. So James Conn wouldn't be surprising if Anne Margaret's hiding in this film already. Well, at at that point in this movie, you you wouldn't be surprised at anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the film gets pretty meta, and the two heroes end up at the Chinese theater. Maxwell got really excited when I explained to him that that's the same Chinese theater that explodes in Iron Man 3. Uh-huh, yeah. Because that's how, that's how deep Maxwell is into these Marvel movies. 
<laughs> did you hear? Did you hear about uh, Spider Man's cameo in the Iron Man films? Uh, no. Um. Well, it's always been a fan theory. And then Tom Holland, the British guy, is playing Spider Man because we can't. We we it, we we need to be giving our American superhero jobs to Americans. Yes. We need to make superhero movies great again. Mm -hmm. Sick of giving our biggest characters, American characters, to British people. I'm sick of it. <laughs> Two Spider-Mans in a row have been British. Doctor Strange is British. I thought Doctor Strange was British though yeah as a character because anytime i've seen dr strange in like an animated movie or a cartoon or anything it's always by the old seeing eyes of agamemnon <laughs> do the spell so when i heard that uh dinglebert slapty back was playing him in the movie i'm like okay that makes sense because he's british but then he does his weird ass american accent and i'm like what <laughs> but but Tom Holland heard this fan rumor about Spider-Man being in one of the Iron Man films. So he went to the Kevin Feige and all the people who are in charge of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And they said, uh, don't tell anybody. But yes, that is Spider-Man. So <laughs> Iron Man 2. Iron Man 2. The, the main setting of Iron Man 2 is the Stark Expo, which is essentially the uh, the like... World's Fair, yeah, that Iron Man is running, and it's taking place in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. in in no in uh, in Queens, which is where Spider Man is from. Right. Of course, this is Iron Man Two, which happens way before like Civil War. So, uh, Spider Man would be very very young, and a young Peter Parker is apparently brought to the Stark Expo and uh, he's a really big fan of Iron Man so he is at the end of the film when the robots start going nuts and shooting random people in the crowd Yeah, Peter Parker is a young kid wearing an Iron Man mask in the crowd he's the little boy who tries to stand up to the robots and the robots are about to kill him and then the real Iron Man shows up behind Peter Parker mm -hmm. and shoots the robots Good job, kid. Yeah, that's Peter Parker in the mask. Nice. As a young child. Yeah. Nice. So that's 100% been confirmed by all the Marvel people. That will be a nice touch. I find, yeah, I, find, I found it interesting that with finally with this Spider-Man movie, they are acknowledging the fact that, oh, wait a second, the first Iron Man came out a really long ass time ago. So people are growing up with superheroes. Mm -hmm. You never hear that. But Spider Man, all the time that Peter Parker's been alive, basically, Tony Stark has been Iron Man. Yes. So he has grown up in New York with these superheroes existing. So I find that interesting. That is you a know? really good point. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, they're addressing shit like that. So anyway, the two heroes end up at the Chinese theater watching their own film's ending, and it's perfect. And as a kid, I was just in love with this film, and I, I just really like the whole um, sheriff going to the Waco kid, and the Waco kid's like, where are you going to? Oh, nowhere in particular. Oh, nowhere in particular. That was always a place I want. I always wanted to go there. So they ride off into the sunset together, and Bella and I are watching the movie, and Bella's going, is he going to ride off into the sunset? And I said, kind of. Oh, wait, what are they doing now, Dad? Oh, they're getting into a limousine. I mean, they're still riding off into the sunset. And Just Max now in a like, limo. What? Yeah. Oh, what's going on? Hey, they're taking the horses away. <laughs> Apparently, this film had its world premiere at a drive-in theater. Really? Yeah, and number one, that's fucking wonderful. And number two, Cleavon Little and Gene Wilder arrived in horses and stayed on the horses for the movie. <laughs> so they sat and watched the entire film on horses at a drive-in. <laughs> That's fucking wonderful. Yeah. 
Yeah. That is, yeah, that is cool. But yeah, and they yeah. had, they had to leave together cause they had such a great bromance going. Cleavon Little and Gene Wilder. Yes, they did. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's the end. It's a great fucking movie. If you don't like it, then get the hell out of this country. Yes. Basically. Because mm-hmm. this is an all-American, wonderful fucking film, and I love we'll, it. We'll and I'm going to use this your film. Ass. Yeah. I'm going to use this film just in case I ever try and it, someone tries to beat the shit out of me. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that excuse me while I whip this out will mm-hmm. stop me from getting beaten up by rednecks here. Cause this is a film we can all agree on. Yes. And that fart c- and that film. fart scene was a work of art. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. There will never in, in fact, be Maxwell, a fart scene like that again. Yeah. Maxwell was in his room. And he wasn't watching the film because it was just like it. He was like, what movie are you watching? It's a Western. It uses a lot of bad words and you can watch it if you want. But I don't know if you'll want to watch it. And he started watching it and there were some funny bits that got his attention. But then it's like, OK, I'm gone. It, yeah. it, it didn't hold his interest a lot. So he spent a lot of time in his room. And then finally, like we got to the fart scene and I'm like, oh, my God. This is right up Maxwell's alley. So I paused it and I'm like, <laughs> Maxwell, get in here. Are you still watching that Western? Yes, you are going to love this. And sure enough, Maxwell was like, oh, he farted. They're, they're farting, Danny. They're farting. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew you would love this. I knew you would love this. And he did. It's a mm-hmm. film we can all agree on. Yes. So for next week, I have three possibilities and bunny i want you to pick which of the three possibilities we do okay okay number one Uh uh-huh guardians of the galaxy volume two okay great fucking movie it's still in theaters and of course we would be talking about that cough cough drive cough cough yes uh, number two, the Belko experiment, which recently came out on DVD. Cough, cough, drive, cough, cough. <laughs> uh, the Belko experiment, a uh, another James Gunn film. Uh huh. Okay. Extremely violent. Features some of his uh, troop of actors. He's got a bit of a troop now. Oh, uh, okay. Or number three. What We Do in the Shadows, which is currently on Amazon Prime. Oh. This is a... Either one of these oh. would be really... I've okay, seen so what write this... Shadows, but, only like, but only like once or twice. The Belko Experiment is insanely violent, and I know I'm going to love it, but I haven't seen that. And Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is just Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Either one of these would be a great choice. Yeah, well, I'm between Guardians of the Galaxy and and what we do in Shadows because, God, I love that movie. Then let's do what we do in the Shadows because um, that stars um, Jermaine Clemens from Flight of the Concords, which I love and which is also on Amazon Prime. So if you're ever bored, Flight of the Concords is one of the greatest shows ever. I love them so much. I, I watched the first season and yeah. part of the second oh, night dropped out, dropped out somewhere around there. That's fine because the first season, they had already been doing their act for like a decade. And so the first season is written around pre-existing songs. So mm. when they when the first season was a success, which they weren't expecting, and they went to do a second season. They wrote songs around the show. And that's a big difference. Yeah. They wrote the, the show around the songs. And now they're writing songs around the show. So the second season is, is okay to not watch. The first season, though, was all fucking perfect. Yeah, the first season was great. Yeah, I love Bowie's in Space. That is the greatest. <laughs> okay, you want? Yeah, there you go. I got it. No, do you want it back? Of course you want it back, because you are Dory. Yeah. 
Okay, so, so that's, we're doing what we what we do in shadows. Next week, what we do in shadows, and for homework, the YouTube playlist, the Pope on Film episode thirty one homework, it's all right there. Uh, Fred Myers, that was a store. Yes. Yeah. Fred Myers. Yeah. So I think. Um. Number one, I think this might be the longest notes I've ever had, which is surprising because this isn't the longest episode we've ever done. But I, I've got, <laughs> I've got, ten, I've got ten pages of notes here. Yeah. Um. So I'm impressed that we were able to get it done as quick as we did. Um. Next week we're going to be talking about Fox News. We're going to be mm-hmm. talking about an exciting new way to die. <laughs> and next week I'm going to be answering questions in book titles. Nice. Like there's a lot of in, in book titles. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, and uh, other questions. I'm going to be answering book titles. So that's going to be fun. I think that this episode. Now I might be wrong. Yeah. But I think this is my own personal opinion. I think this has been a good episode. This has been a damn good episode. You know what? I concur. I concur. This this may be one of our best episodes. Oh, now no, that's adorable. <laughs> so until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve saying thanks for listening. That was pausing YouTube and rushing over here. Uh, where was I again? Oh, yes. Uh... And I am Reverend Steve saying thanks for listening, and we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you douche waffles and poopy tits. If, he's, if Max was even still saying he, 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 I, he is when he's not asleep, and he's asleep now, so thank you. He, he hasn't doo-doo-doo. said it in the past year. <laughs> yeah, he hasn't, he hasn't said it in a while. He He's a sleepy boy. do 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 you were dancing to the theme song, baby. Oh, good job. Do 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 shaking your booty. Do 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 a bunch of people are watching the new Netflix show Glow. I haven't gotten to it yet, but it's on my list. I haven't gotten to it yet because I have kids and I know it's going to be dirty, but I've spent like the last week explaining to people that it was an actual show. Yeah. And I was like, uh, uh, people are like, Steve, have you watched Glow yet? It's right up your alley. Have you watched Glow yet? It's like, no, I haven't watched it yet, but, you know, I've got little kids and also, you know, you know, I, I watched the original. The original what? The original show, Glow, The Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. Oh, my God, that was a show? <laughs> and I was like, yes, it's a show, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to tell you anymore because we work together, and it would be awkward for me to explain that uh, as a young man growing up, uh, yeah! Glow was wonderful fapping material. Yes. Yes, it was. Yeah. It was perfect. You just get these like attractive models and put them in skippy outfits and have them run wrestling all over the place. Oh God, I love that show. <laughs> wrestling meets hee haw. Yeah, that was a great, dumb, stupid show. I loved Glow. So no, I don't have to watch the original. Although I might because uh, 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 one of the girls from Community is naked in it. Uh huh. So. That's reason enough to watch and Glow. How long did Glow last exactly? Only like three, maybe three years, three or four years. There was a documentary that was on Netflix for the longest time, and it was freaking adorable, and I loved it. And it interviewed all of the women. Yeah. And uh, I, I always thought, like, okay, none of these people ever went and did anything big, right? But then I realized, holy shit, one of them was a diva a wwf diva yeah like holy sh- one of them still continued to wrestle all the <laughs> other ones just ended up being married and having kids but holy shit one of them went on to the big time 
But see now, you know? see now, I had never heard of Glow. Okay. And then for a short time, I had moved to Virginia. And that's where I had first seen Glow. I was just flipping channels and it was on. And I just thought it was because I was in Virginia, you know? Yeah. Like, okay, I'm on, I am in Dixie now. This is how things are here. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, Glow was syndicated, so it was never like a, you know, sometimes they would carry it and sometimes they wouldn't carry it. It was kind of random. It was kind of like, like, uh, what's the word? Uh, it was kind of like Star Trek, the next generation. Right. You Star, Tr- Star Trek, you 21 just... Jump Street. Yeah. Or, you know, a few others in that same time period where like, it seemed like it was always on somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But you never specifically knew where or when that was glow. Yes. You yeah. would just you would just flip the channels and it would be oh close on. Yeah. So it was on for a while. It, I'm trying to figure out exactly how long it was on TV, but uh four seasons. There you go. Boom. Four seasons. All right. But they weren't big seasons. We're only talking like about ten or twelve episodes a season, so Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the documentary is called Glow, the story of the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. It came out in 2011. Yeah, I I had seen that. Is that still on Netflix? I I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but uh, all I remember is that it was. And you don't see a lot of documentaries leave Netflix. You ever notice that? Yeah. And especially if you're going to come out with the Netflix original series Glow. I yeah. would think if I was Netflix, I would want to have the documentary. Uh, okay, okay. Um, one of the women from Glow ended up being Ivory in the WWF. Mm. Yeah, she was a huge ass heel. Yeah. She wrestled for WWF between 1999 and 2005. She was the women's champion twice. She was a member of the Right to Censor. The right to censor. <laughs> yeah. The RTC. She was like a conservative. Was that the they thing were the that, people uh, that tried to like cover up like, the, like nudity and stuff? Was that was that the one oh god, what the fuck was his name? Horrible wrestler. S- Horrible. Stevie. Yes. Yes. S- and he did a rip off of he did a rip off of Cactus Jack. And Dude Love. Yeah. Well, maybe not yeah. Cactus Jack, but he did a ripoff of Dude Love. He was the RTC, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was in the right sense. Yeah. yeah, he was just a, he was a he was just a shit wrestler that could not he couldn't get a character that fit him. Yeah, he was a jobber. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, maybe we'll talk about Glow next week. Maybe we won't. I don't know. (laughs) Cut and print. Cut and print.